tuned in to the Community Cats Podcast. Ready? Let's go. Welcome to the Community Cats Podcast. I'm your host, Stacey LeBaron. I have been involved helping homeless cats for over 20 years with the Merrimack River Feline Rescue Society. The goal of this podcast is to expose you to amazing people who are improving the lives of cats. I hope these interviews will help you learn how you can turn your passion for cats into action. Today, we're speaking with Michael Moorfield. Michael has worked as operations manager for the Arizona Animal Welfare League and SPCA for two and a half years. He has transitioned into the communications and marketing manager position for the last nine months. He has one rescue dog named Riker, who was adopted from the local county shelter five years ago as a puppy. Michael, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. So I was just wondering, uh, how did you get started in animal welfare? You know, like many people, I worked in the private sector and I would punch the clock and do my job. And at the end of the day, I felt like I wasn't making a difference. It really got frustrating to me that we dedicate so much of our lives to working, making sure that everything revolves around that work schedule and so on. And it was killing me to see how many hours a day I was working towards goals that I felt didn't make a difference in larger society. So I started working with different organizations as a volunteer and talking to people. It was just a perfect, amazing moment that a position opened up at the Arizona Animal Welfare League and I was able to get in. And now every day I do something that makes a difference, whether it's small or big, it's so amazing to go home every day and say, I did something that makes a difference in my community and it's made every day better. So when you first started, did you have a a mentor or somebody that you worked with that helped guide you into this new career? At the time, I didn't. It was a lot of people in the community all came together and said, whatever you need, we're here to help. When you're dealing with a lot of animal people, you know that we're all working towards the same goal. We work in an alliance of shelters in the Maricopa County area, and there's always this kind of unofficial phrase, it's same team. We're all on the same team. Yes, we all have our own donor sources. Yes, we have our own projects and so on, but we are in this together. So it was so great to be able to reach out to smaller rescues or organizations or animal welfare groups and ask them questions. And everybody was very forthcoming because they knew that we were all fighting towards the same goal. And we make the joke that we work really hard so that our jobs don't exist anymore. And so that I hope one day I come into work, there's no animals to take in, I'll retire and buy an ice cream cart but I don't see that day anytime soon. But having this outpouring of support from everybody, knowing that we're all working towards something so important, that's how it really helped me grow into this position. That's interesting that you say that. In New England, we actually are starting to transport in quite a large number of cats up into the New England area. And we've been bringing dogs up for a long, long time. And, um, you know, there are questions about what's going to happen if all the population does get controlled all around the country. Uh, What does the future of our world look like at at that point in time? It seems like a mind boggling question probably for you in Arizona at this point in time. But maybe maybe 10 years down the road, it, it will be a question. Absolutely. And we're hoping it is. It's one of those, well, it's a good problem to have when you aren't having animals brought to you on a daily basis because they're sick or injured or people are unable to care for them. Parts of Phoenix are actually having an issue right now with roving bands of chihuahuas. It's one of those things you just don't expect in the United States. Uh, That community has a large Hispanic population, and culturally it's more normal to have community dogs or dogs around. And we've been working with that community with the Fix It Up Save Alliance and talking to them about spay and neuter and about that community dogs are not a thing, that yes, there are community cats and there's programs to help you with that, but we're still seeing these dogs living on the street as community dogs and trying to find ways to help integrate them back into either shelters or into homes. But we hope that one day 
we don't see those cases coming in. And then we get to just realize that we finally communicated to the population how important it is. I hope one day my job doesn't exist. (laughs) I think we all do. And we've seen definite improvements over the last 20 years. And let's see what happens over the next five or 10 years and see how we're at. But talking about the situation at hand right now, middle of the summer, it's kitten season. So how are things going with kitten season in Arizona? We take in almost 1,300 kittens a year into our foster program, and almost all of those kittens are from community cats or feral colonies. Very few of them are oops litters of people that have their own domestic cat that then had a litter that wasn't spayed or neutered. That's rare. A lot of it is these cats that are found outdoors, these kittens that are found outdoors that are brought to us. Our kitten season is so long, since cats will only go into heat when it's warm, Our kitten season can last almost 10 months long in Arizona. And that means that a kitten can be born at the beginning of kitten season and have her own litter of kittens by the end of kitten season. So that's why it's so important for us to work with our communities and the different shelters and get the spays and neuters, work with TNR groups, bring those kittens in the shelters and get them adopted because that's just a massive amount. We're just one shelter among five major groups in the Valley and our number of 13 is about average for the other groups. In 2013, 30,000 cats came into the Maricopa County animal care system. That's a staggering number. That's an unbelievable number. We've been able to lower that as a group significantly, as well as we were able to lower the euthanasia rate at Maricopa County shelters by 73% in the last three years because we all worked together towards the common goal. And a large part of that was cats. So when you're talking about working together, do you have a coalition? We have a we have an alliance of the main shelters in the valley, as well as a coalition of smaller rescues that have gotten together and they have representatives that then sit in the meetings as well. It wasn't that way for a long time. It was, you know, it was the kind of atmosphere that a lot of people see, that environment of everybody working on their own without really speaking to each other. And we realized, one, we were reinventing the wheel a lot on processes and procedures and community outreach and realize that without integrating with each other and talking with each other, we were doing the animals of Maricopa County a disservice. And we just sat down and said, we're done. We're working together. This is happening. We were able to get some grants to help fund some programs. So you have, you know, you have these programs that allowed us to go into communities and do TNR, uh, provide education materials. Uh, So that really was lucky to have that. But a lot of it, it wasn't money. It was just having conversations, working together, realizing how we can all help each other in different ways. That's what made such a big difference. I, I tell people in communities that don't have that alliance or or those partnerships, it needs to happen. I spoke with a gentleman from Australia and obviously their animal control issues are very different than the United States, but they also run into the same problems we do. He said he, in his area, there's two groups, his and another, and they rarely speak to each other. And I said, you just need to get past it. You need to talk to each other. You're dealing with the same problems. You're dealing with the same solutions. When you work together, everything will get easier. Agreed. I'm I'm a big fan of uh, coalitions and partnering and getting support, sharing best practices and sharing worst practices. I mean, we all have to learn from our mistakes. And oftentimes I find everybody has to still do the same mistakes in order to learn them, which I sometimes wish one group could learn. And then we could all learn from that one group's, you know, mistakes. But it seems like we all kind of have to go down the road together. But then we pick each other up and help move us along. Going back to kitten season, do you have any um, tips as to how your organization handles the overpopulation or the influx of the greater population of kittens? Talk to your community and find out what resources are out there. There is no one group that can do it all. All the spay and neuters, all the adoptions, all the TNRs. So find the groups that are already doing that and then work hard at what you are able to do. We are able to build a large foster network and get animals into foster, but yet 
we can't take them all. So we have a list of different organizations that are taking kittens at the time. We have bottle baby resources. So that way, if we can't take bottle babies, because as you know, it's such a very specialized foster home that's able to care for them and that constant round the clock care, that if we're not able to take them in, we don't overstretch ourselves by thinking we're the only ones that can do it. So then we put pressure too much pressure on our system and something will fail. We provide resources from another organization in the Valley because we work together on how to best try and be a bottle baby foster for the first time. It might not be totally successful, but you're giving them a better chance than they ever would on their own, as well as communicating with the people in your community. Maybe people say, oh, I found these kittens under a bush and I brought them to you. Okay, stop, wait. Maybe the mom is there. Maybe the mom is able to care for these kittens and raise them. Once they're old enough, you know, provide them resources, how to know how they're older, set up a TNR program, work with your neighbors. If these are cats you found in a park near your house, work with your local HOA or your groups on how to catch those kittens when they're young and then get them uh, spayed or neutered, as well as just really opening those lines of dialogue so that people understand that community cats are a thing. We created this problem as people, and now we're trying to find a solution for it. But informing them that there are community cats, that there are resources for those kittens, that if we're not able to do it, provide them with resources of people that may be able to help them as well. You don't need to be the jack of all trades. You need to make sure that you can communicate with your community if you're feeling overwhelmed on how they can still get those resources if you can't provide them. Do you ever do uh, special adoption events during the summer months? You know, a fee waived adoption or any sort of special campaigns? Yes. Most of our summer, we will waive our adoption fees for our adult cats. Last month was National Adopt a Shelter Cat Month. So we waived the adoption fees of our adult cats. And then actually, we also built a spin the wheel to win game where they would get prizes as well with, you know, cat toys that have been donated or gift cards from local businesses that were provided to us or donated to us to really show off our adult cats. But then we start doing two for one kittens and talking to people about how kittens can really do well together, that adopting two kittens is not as overwhelming as you think, because if you're already adopting one kitten, that second kitten will help play with them, help them socialize. It's not as chaotic as people might think. Oh my God, one kitten is totally crazy and I love it, but the second kitten's gonna be like a multiplier effect. It's not, and we talk a lot about that. The two for one kitten special is big, as well as waiving adoption fees on adult cats. We've gotten comments back throughout the years about fee waived adoptions on cats and dogs, about the fears that people have, but a lot of studies have come out and proven that the fears that people have about fee waived adoption are not warranted, that they still provide good adoptions, that you're still providing that counseling. We don't see a decline in the quality of adopters when we waive our adoption fees for our adult cats or do adoption specials like two for one kittens. Those are very important resources during kitten season, basically mandatory. And then um, you also have a large volunteer foster home network. Do you have like a dedicated foster home coordinator? Is that a staff position? We are lucky enough to have a foster manager and coordinator who work together to place animals into homes, work with foster in-home programs, such as the people bringing the kittens to them, trying to convert them into fosters themselves, explain the, the positives of foster, they explain the, the resources we can provide them as fosters and the good that they're doing in their community. That can be very helpful to take that pressure off a foster network that you've already built by basically convincing them that they can be a part of the solution and we can help. That's a big part of our foster growing program. But we are lucky enough to have two staff members that work just with our foster programs to set up medical appointments, which we do all of our medical care in-house, provide supplies when we can, and resources as well. And now let's take a moment to listen to a few words from our sponsors. Flashlight tag was fun when you were a kid, but no one wants to play hide and seek with their trap. Find your trap's location quickly and safely, even when you visit it at night with the Reveal Wild application for Samsung Galaxy, HTC One, Sony, Xperia, and other Android phones. Or go to tinyurl.com forward slash reveal wild. 
Does your organization support any TNR initiatives or partnerships with other organizations? Yes, we work with the Animal Defense League of Arizona, which has basically led the charge on community cats and TNR programs in the Valley. They are part of the alliance that we work together, the Fix It Up Save Alliance. They also work with a group called Altered Tales that does high volume spay and neuters for community cats, voucher programs, as well as just being a resource in the community for spay and neuters. Adla and Alter Tales work very closely with all groups to help the community cat program. We have worked with Adla because we do have a colony of cats near the shelter that we have cared for over the years. We've actually turned our TNRs into a party of sorts. Sometimes it's tough to convince people to go set up traps, deal with stinky cat food, and then sit around at night and wait for them to set off the traps in the dark. So what do you usually do when you have to be around a group of people, it's usually dark, and you have a lot of free time? Well, you socialize and you have a party. So we have turned it into these kind of fiesta parties. We do ours on property. We have a section behind the shelter where the the colony is. So what we'll do is we'll go inside. We have food that people bring and we all cook. We all talk and chat. We also turn the traps into a game. Everybody gets a trap and puts it where they think the trap will work best. Then we kind of have like a ongoing bet. It's like a dollar or, you know, 25 cents. See whose trap gets set off first. By investing people into this, besides, of course, the community aspect of helping and making a difference for these community cats, it makes it fun. And we've started to talk to people like Adla and Alter Tales about this program so that when they go to HOAs or communities where they're having a problem and they don't have a feral colony manager or community cat focused person in that area or in that neighborhood to try and give them the resource to say, this is how it's fun. They provide the traps. They help set up the appointments for the spay and neuters. They have voucher programs to help cover the cost of many of the community cat spay and neuters. But when you tell people, okay, so have a party. If you're all going to be hanging out with your friends anyways, make sure you're not loud and raucous outside by where the traps are, where it needs to be quiet. But you make bets, you have fun, you guys all do a potluck. All of a sudden, it's not this weird, I don't know what I'm doing, I'm stressed out about this. It now becomes something fun with guidance and making a difference in your neighborhood. That sounds great. And uh, it gets that challenge going. I know there are quite a few trappers out there that would love to be the first, catching the first cat or even more importantly, catching the last cat. Yes. I love that sense of competition. You know, we're humans. We we're competitive people. We like to do it. And if you can make it fun, everything's better. So if people were interested in finding out more about your work and what you're doing, how could people find you? We are located on the web at aawl.org, as well as on Facebook at Arizona Animal Welfare League. We like to have a busy social media campaign because we have great animals to show off and innovative programs that we've created to help our community. And those are the two best locations to find us. And is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners today? Please get involved with your local community. I know that the people listening to your podcast are people that are engaged and wanting to find solutions to this problem. You have to realize that those local rescues, they're as local as you can possibly get. They're as integrated into their community as you can possibly get. They are catching or rescuing local animals, getting local dollars and donations to adopt to local families. Please volunteer, adopt, donate, support your local shelter. You can support us over here in Arizona. I would love it. But providing that money and those donations to support people that are actively trying to make your animal welfare community better, that is the most important thing you can do to help this problem. It's excellent. I mean, I think that if if we all do our own little part or big part, whatever it is that we can do, doing something is very important that we all play a role in caring for the cats in our community. So I want to thank you for that closing thought. That's great. So thank you again for agreeing to be a guest on my show. And I really hope you'll be able to come back in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thanks for listening to the Community Cats podcast. If you could go to iTunes and review the show, we'd really appreciate it. When you do, take a screenshot of your review, go to communitycatspodcast.com forward slash review and enter your information and we'll send you a t-shirt. While you're there, don't forget to check out all the ways you can support the content you're passionate about. Thanks, everyone. Wow.